let's look at what we mean by a hash function and then state some requirements on a cryptographic hash function. I would usually not say cryptographic hash function, I'll just say hash function, but we, because we're talking about security, implies a cryptographic hash function. Hash functions have many different uses. One is for security and, and also for other purposes. So uh, the ones for security have certain requirements. What is a hash function? Well, we can start by saying that a hash function is some function that normally takes a variable size input. The input of that function could be of any length, and in this case denoted as m, and produces a fixed size output, the hash value we call it. So although it can get confusing, the hash function is usually written as uppercase h. The hash of some message produces a hash value, or simply just a hash, which is denoted as lowercase h. And that function, h, uppercase h, when we apply it to many different inputs, it should produce outputs which are evenly distributed and random looking. So it should produce random outputs. That is, the hash values should appear like random numbers or random strings. Evenly distributed means that if we have, say, uh, a thousand inputs, a thousand possible inputs, and 20 possible outputs, evenly distributed means that on average of those a thousand inputs, uh, what is it, 50 of them should map to one of the possible outputs, another 50 to one of the other outputs, and so on, such that of those inputs, an equal number mapped to each possible output. They don't all go to one value, for example. And random looking in that, uh, that is, the output hash value we can think is a random number. With cryptographic hash functions, they have those features, but we have additional requirements. And in Simple terms, it should be impossible for someone to find a message M, the input, if they know the hash value. So a hash function takes a, a message as input and produces a hash value as output. That should be easy to calculate, but going the other way should be hard. The inverse is, given the output H, find the original message M that should be practically impossible to do. Computationally infeasible, meaning it would take too long to, to do that. And it's called, or in simpler terms, we'll see some other definitions, it's called the one-way property. The hash function should be easy to calculate in one direction, but hard to calculate in the other direction. Another property is that the hash of two different messages, M1 and M2, should produce different hash values. Or, the other way, it's practically impossible to, for someone to find two different messages that produce the same hash value. So from a security perspective, it should be hard to find the original message given only the hash and it should be hard to find two different messages that produce the same hash. And that will be important when we use hash functions for authentication. We use hash functions to determine whether something's changed or not, whether our message has been modified or not. And in the same way as MAC functions, we can provide authentication and data integrity. But there are other purposes for hash functions, so in security and, and uh, even in other systems. So we'll use it for message authentication. I receive a message. I want to be sure that the message has not been modified and that it comes from the person who they claim to be. That's the same as we saw for MAC functions. And a specific instance of that is what we call digital signatures. And that has the, the purpose of I want to be able to sign a message. 
such that when someone receives that message that they can prove that it came from me, not anyone else. So we'll look at digital signatures. We will not look at passwords, but another aspect of computer security is how to store passwords. And hash functions are commonly used in the storage of passwords. Instead of storing the actual password of a user on a computer system, we store the hash of the password. They're used in virus detection, so to create signatures of, of malicious software and for an antivirus software to detect that virus, hash functions are commonly used. Hash functions are used in pseudo-random number generators. Because hash functions produce a random output, or random looking output, they can be used to produce random numbers. And a number of other applications where hash functions are used in security and other aspects of computing. We can think of the hash function as providing some mapping. That mapping takes an input of some length L bits, the message, for example. So we have some message of some variable length, so it can be different lengths, different number of bits. Often we'll attach the actual length to that message. So that's just a, a practical feature. So we take some message of variable length as input to the hash function, and it produces a fixed length output. And the output is usually small relative to the possible inputs. Given that the input can be variable length and the output fixed length, property two, is it possible to find collisions? Why is it possible to find collisions? because the length of the hash value is smaller than the possible inputs. So there are more potential inputs than there are potential outputs. Same with a map. So in theory, yes, there will be collisions. That is, two different inputs will map to the same output. But the, the strength of hash functions for cryptographic purposes relies on that it should be hard to find those inputs that produce the same output. It's not that they don't exist. It should be hard to find them. What's an example of a hash function? The name of a hash function. MD5 is one that you may have seen and come across. Where have you seen MD5 in use? Checking file integrity. Maybe you download a file and maybe post it on the website where you download from. There's also a hash value, an MD5 hash value, with the idea that when you download the file, you calculate the hash of that file and compare it to the one on the website. Now, there are some security flaws of that, but in some instances that allows you to confirm that the file that you downloaded is the correct file. So MD5 is one. Any others? SHA, S-H-A, the secure hash algorithm. So MD5 and SHA are two widely used hash algorithms. We will not go through how they work, uh, there's a few slides at the end that talk about their characteristics, but they are two that we'll use in examples and that you'll see a lot. Let's give an example. Here's our first message. So we have a message. And many systems will have a, a program to calculate the MD5 hash or the SHA hash of, of a file. So I've got something called MD5 sum. MD5 sum takes as an input usually a file. And what MD5 sum does is takes the contents of that file and calculates the hash value. 
what do you think the hash value is going to be? Can you predict it? It should be random, okay, so we, we cannot predict it. All right, if we'd done it before, we'd know. Uh, how long do you think it will be? The same as a message. No, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, in fact, in this case, I have a quite a small message. We'll try a longer message. The message length can be any size. We'll try it from different size soon. The hash value is usually fixed length, and it depends upon the algorithm as to the length. MD5 produces, we'll see. Let's calculate it. Okay, it's done. So we calculated the hash of the contents of that file and we got this value as output. It's represented in hex. How many hex characters are there? 32 hex characters times by 4. 128 bits. MD5 produces a 128 bit hash value. Okay. So it's actually 128 bits, but to show it on the computer, it converts to hex and prints to hex characters. One hex character is four bits. Okay, let's do the MD5 sum of two different or two other files, message two and message three. What can you tell me about message two? It's different from message one because the hash values are different. That is, the hash of message one and the hash of message two are different, which implies that the two different, with two different inputs, we get two different outputs. That was our requirement for our hash function. So this suggests to us that message two, not the file name, but the contents of the file are different than the contents of the file message one. And message three? The hash value is the same as for message one, which implies that the two files are the same. Okay, so that's one way we use the hash function. Let's check message one, message two, and message three. Message one and three are the same, message two is missing a full stop. Okay, so that's what we expected from the hash values. One and two are different, one and three are the same. Different just by one character. Okay, and when we said that the hash function should produce random outputs and evenly distributed, it means that even if the inputs are very similar, so almost the same except for one character, just a few bits different, then the hash values should be completely different if they're random. And that's what we see here, that there's no, that the two hash values are not similar. Just because the inputs are similar, it doesn't mean the hash values will be similar. Let's try it on a bigger file. Uh, where? I have a, a one of our virtual nodes, uh, our base, just a large file, 800 megabytes. Uh, let's calculate the hash on that. So a larger file takes some time, but it gets there. Okay, so the hash on that, just to show it works. We'll try char in a moment, yes. Let's modify the file. Let's look. That, this is a compressed file. So think of it as, as uh, a binary file. So I'll just look at the first, maybe, um, 32 bytes of that file. 
that's the first 32 bytes of the file, so of course it's much larger than that. Let's just change one bit in the file. Okay, so to change it, I'm going to run a command that would change, let's say 96, this is in hex, to 97. So we'll change 96 to 97, everything else should be the same in the file. And then we'll do the hash. Of those 800 megabytes, we want to see what's the impact of ch changing just one bit. Doesn't matter the command we use to change, uh, it just changes 96, the search and replace, into say hexadecimal 97 uh, on that file. It'll take some time and let's call it base 2. Hopefully this works. Take some time, it's just changing because it needs to read through the whole file and we see we have two files the same size and now calculate the MD5 sum on the second one. We'll do it on the first so it's easy to compare again on the first file and on the second file the file name does not matter what MD5 sum does is calculates the MD5 hash on the contents of the file that's just what this program does so the contents of the file does not contain the, the file name so it's of no consequence if I rename the file we'll do that different name, we get the same hash value. So it's working on the contents of the file and again this is showing that the hash of two different files differing by just uh, a, a minimum one bit, okay, just a few bits in worst case, of 800 megabytes give two completely different hash values. That's what we'd like. We'll get to the SHA sum as well in a moment. One more example. Make it clear, MD5, I have a binary file instead of a text file. Again, so this is just on a, not a text file, but a, a binary file, just actually random bits or, or a sequence of bits. Just to be clear, they're both 128 bytes long, the hash. What does it say about the two files? Hash values are the same means the contents of the files are the same. Okay. There's a program called CMP, it compares two files, the binary contents. This program says the files differ. The hash function, the hash values are the same. Okay, that implies the files are the same. Let's look closer. Uh, this may be hard to see but we'll try. Zoom out a bit. There's the first one. And there's the second one. Are they the same? Can anyone spot any differences? Last row. Here's one difference. 2B, AB. And I think there are a few others in there. The files are different. Okay, the contents of these two files are different. But the hash, hashes of the files are the same. What does that tell us? If MD5 considers the entire con contents, it, it tells us that we've found a collision. A collision is when we take two different messages as input and produce the same hash value. And that's what we've done here. Two different messages they differ by a few bits. When we calculate the MD5 hash of each, they get different 
they get the same hash value. That's the problem. We said that it should be computationally infeasible for someone to find two different messages that produce the same hash value. With MD5, the algorithm is considered insecure for cryptographic purposes because people have found ways to find the hash of two different messages using MD5 that produce the same hash value. And that was one example. Those bits were, were created to find two different messages that produce the same hash value. So we want it to be difficult to do that. We know in theory it's possible, but it should be hard for someone to find messages. If they can find them easily, then we say that hash algorithm is insecure. And MD5 today is considered in insecure. We'll do that again. Two different messages on input produce the same hash value, but we said the other hash function is called SHA. And there's variations of SHA. There's SHA version 1, and then there's SHA version 2 that takes different length or produce different length outputs. One produces 160 bits as output. I think one produces 256 bits of output. We'll calculate that one. SHA producing a 256 bit hash value of those two different files produces different hash values. That's good. The point is that SHA, in, in the specific instances of SHA, that is there are some old ones which are not secure, but SHA-256 is considered secure in that it's practically impossible to, for someone to find two different messages that produce the same hash value. MD5 is considered insecure because it is possible to find collisions although it's still used in some cases because it's so widely uh, implemented and it's been used for a long time. SHA, as we'll see, has different variants. Version 1, version 2, version 3. Version 1 is considered insecure. Version 2, with particular length hash values, is considered secure for most purposes. Version 3, secure. MD5 considered insecure. Although there are some purposes where we can use MD5 where we don't care about collisions, so it's still used in practice in some cases. There's SHA-512. Which just produces, uses the same algorithm but produces, produces a longer hash value as output, 512 bits. Let's, let's look at an example of how we can use hash functions for authentication. Message authentication. We want to check the integrity of the message that we receive. I want to make sure that the data that I received is the same as what was sent, and that the person who sent that data is who they say they are. The same with Max. And we use the hash function to provide message authentication. The output we'll call either the hash value or sometimes it's referred to as the message digest. What's the name of a hash function? The insecure one? MD5. MD, message digest. Okay, the message digest algorithm 5. So sometimes we, recall, we call the hash value a message digest, the digest. So let's see how we can use a hash function. And there are a few examples here. Uh, maybe with the time remaining we'll choose 
but we'll stick with this one. This one's easy. In this case, we use it in a similar way to a MAC function, but the difference between a hash and a MAC function, a hash doesn't take a key as input. So in this case, we have a message. We want to send to B. And let's say the message is uh, a secret key, a random set of bits. We want to encrypt it so no one can see it. But so that B can check that they've got the right output when they decrypt, we'll also use the hash function. So what we do in this case is we take the message, calculate the hash of the message, we get a short hash value as output, and then we combine that with a message and encrypt them all with a symmetric key encryption algorithm, send that to B, B decrypts, and then checks. And the checking is similar to a MAC function. Take the received message, M, calculate the hash of the received message, and compare the calculated value with the received hash value. And the assumption is if they match, everything's okay. If they don't match, something's gone wrong. Because if they don't match, it implies that the two messages that were used as input were different. And they should be the same. We may see some attacks on this or similar ones. Uh, maybe we'll do that next week. But let's look at one other example, which is uh, where? A different one. Here's one. Here's a, a way of using a hash function to, again, prove that you're the sender without encrypting. This approach uses no encryption. What it relies on is that both A and B have a shared secret key, S in this case. What the sender A does is takes their shared secret S, combines it with the message, so this is concatenation, and then calculates a hash and combines the hash value with the message and sends the message on to B. There is no encryption here, no confidentiality. What B does is uses their shared secret to confirm that this message came from A. Ten minutes remaining, try and perform an attack on this scheme. So the scheme is no encryption is used, just the hash function. There's no confidentiality. We want B to be able to confirm that this message came from A. And S is a shared secret. They both know it. No one else knows S. So see what an attacker needs to do to defeat this scheme. For example, modify the message and have it go unnoticed at B, or send a fake message to B pretending to be A. Try, and I'll start drawing it. When you say, is it possible, what we want to find is, what are the requirements to make it impossible? It's possible under certain conditions, and that will define what we require of our hash function. A sends the message concatenated with a hash 
of the message concatenated with S. That's what's sent by A in this scheme. Let's say the malicious user intercepts. And they're going to modify something and send it on to B. With the intent of tricking B into thinking it came from A and it hasn't been modified. So what can the malicious user do? First, can the malicious user see the message? Can they see the contents of the message? Of course, the message is not encrypted, so there's no confidentiality in this case. We're not trying to achieve that. The malicious user sees the message. What if they modify the message? Let's try. So if they send a modified message, let's denote it as M prime and concatenate with the hash. Let's say don't, they don't modify the hash value. It's the same as before. They just modify the message. What does B do? B takes the received message, M prime, concatenates, concatenates with their secret, calculates the hash, and let's say they get hash calculated, the calculated value, and the hash value they received HR is this part. Does the hash value calculated equal the hash value received? Why not? So what B did was we receive a message. We know the secret S, so we join the message and the, the secret S and we calculate the hash using our hash function and we get HC, the calculated hash value. But we also received a hash value, this component, which I denote as HR. And because the inputs of the hash functions are different, then the hash values should be different. So B will detect this by realizing HC does not equal HR, Therefore, something's gone wrong. B detects something's gone wrong in this case. What else could the malicious user do? What if, when the malicious user changed the message to defeat this check, what they need to do is find a message M prime such that when they combine it with S, it will produce the hash value the same as HR. But since they don't know S, they don't know what to combine it with. So they cannot try and find the same hash value HC. What else can malicious user try to do? Recalculate the hash? Okay, so it, I think people will see that it won't work, but let's try it. We try to recalculate that hash value. We send M prime blue M prime, concatenated with a hash of M prime, concatenated with what? We would like to include S here and then it would work, but S is secret. 
So the malicious user shouldn't know S. So some other value, S prime you want, okay. B checks. Calculate the hash of the received message, M prime, with the secret shared with A. And the received hash value is just this component. S doesn't equal S prime, therefore HC doesn't equal HR. Again, B detects the change. And this relies on the characteristic of our hash function. The hash of two different inputs produces two different outputs. So if the attacker could find an input that produced the same output, that would be successful. But without knowing S, they have a, a challenge there. What about from a different perspective? Can the attacker find S? How would the attacker find S? It's not encrypted. They know the hash of the message of S. There's no private key. How could they find S? Or what approach would they take to find S? Brute force, okay, S is long enough. What does the attacker know? If they can find S, they'll defeat the scheme. They know M, they know the hash of M concatenated with S. If they, so they know the hash value. If they can, given the hash value, find the input, so they know some hash value, H. If they can do the inverse, that is the inverse of the hash function on the output, should return M concatenated with S. So given the hash value, try and calculate what the original input was. If they can do that, they get M concatenated with S. Since they know M, S is easy to find. We said the one-way property of hash functions means that it should be hard, computationally hard, practically impossible, given the hash value, go back and find the original input, M concatenated with S. So as long as we have that one-way property, the attacker will not be able to find M concatenated with S and cannot find S. So we see in this scheme, its security depends upon those properties. One-way property, it's hard to go back given the hash value to find the input, and the collision-free property. It's hard for someone to find two messages that produce the same hash value. And if that's, those properties hold, this scheme is useful for authentication. What we'll do next lecture is look at some of those other schemes, but you should try also with these schemes what I commonly ask in exams is, here's a scheme, show me why the attacker cannot defeat it. And that requires you to ask yourself, what if the attacker did this? How would B detect that? What if the attacker did something else? How would B detect it? And it leads to the required properties of our hash functions.